seven summits and I swam the seven seas But the road I must travel, its end I cannot see Well I fought in the jungles and I fought in the streets But the road I must travel Good afternoon, this is Ernie Powell and this is the campaign with Ernie Powell on Radio Titans. Let me, before we get going on it with our show today, and it's going to be one great show because we got one great guest, I want to talk a little bit about what we do on the campaign with Ernie Powell. The design of this show and the intent of this show is to talk about how progressives win campaigns. What are the techniques? What are the means by which we mobilize at the grassroots level? And what are the issues that we care most about? So the guests that we have on these shows know a lot about the work of winning progressive campaigns and the tools that one needs um, to mobilize the public, to mobilize at the grassroots level. Um, we talk about tactics, we talk about strategies, and we talk about how to win and maintain and improve the great progressive um, ideals that brought us Social Security, Medicare, civil rights, uh, rights, for, um, rights for women, rights for uh, LGBT couples and others. And so what you hear and what the discussion is typically about is how we get to that. Our guest today is somebody that I've admired and followed for a number of years. His name is Robert Shear, and I'll be right back with an introduction of our guest, Bob Shear. Once again, this is Ernie Powell, and this is the campaign with Ernie Powell. Well, once I had a reason, don't know what it could be, and the road I must travel, its end I cannot see. Well, I sang to myself that I want to be free, but the road I must travel, its end I cannot see. Okay, welcome back. So as I said, um, I want to introduce to our audience our, our guest today, Bob Shear. Also co-hosting on our show is Carl Kozlowski. He'll be asking some questions as well. We're going to be covering a, a, a great number of very important topics, but let me the, give you the background on, on Mr. Shear. Mr. Bob Shear has built a reputation for strong social and political writing over his last 30 years as a journalist. His columns appear in newspapers across the country, and his in-depth interviews have made headlines. He conducted the famous Playboy magazine interview with Jimmy Carter, on which Jimmy Carter confessed to the lust in his heart, and he went on to do many other interviews for the Los Angeles Times with Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and many other prominent political and cultural figures. Between 64 and 1969, he was Vietnam correspondent, managing editor uh, and editor-in-chief at Ramparts Magazine. I remember Ramparts. I read it during uh, my early years as a, uh, as a radical going to college. From 1976 to 1993, Scheer served as a national correspondent for the LA Times, writing on diverse topics such as the Soviet Union, arms control, national politics, and the military. In 1993, he launched a nationally syndicated column based at the LA Times where he was named a, a contributing editor. That column ran weekly for the next 12 years and is now based at the San Francisco Chronicle. Bob has can be heard on the on the political radio program Left, Right, and Center on KCRW. He has written eight books, including Thinking Tuna Fish, Talking Death, Essays on the Pornography of Power, uh, With Enough Shovels, Reagan Bush, Nuclear War, and America with Nixon. And just recently, um, he has authored and is now and is now out there for purchase. They know everything about you. How data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Bob was raised in the Bronx, where he attended public schools and graduated from City College of New York. He studied as a Maxwell Fellow at Syracuse University and was a fellow at the Center for Chinese Studies at the University of California, as well as currently being a syndicated columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. Shear is also a clinical professor. In communications at USC, an editor of, of the of web of the an editor uh, of Webby Award-winning political website Truthdig, um, and so I am very pleased as somebody who's been involved in progressive politics almost all of my adult life to have a very um, somebody I really respect and admire and whose work I have followed for years. Bob Shearer, welcome to the campaign. Great, but if we're so hot, how come we're still here having to fight for all these causes? <laughs> 
You didn't tell me you were going to get existential on me. <laughs> now, let me, I, I would like to uh, raise a question with you because Please. you talk about a lifetime of organizing and so forth, and you do talk legitimately about progress. I like to hear about progress. I actually, I'm an old guy, and I was born in 1936, and my father lost his job the day I was born, and and uh, my father uh, had another family, and uh, I went through a lot of economic hardship uh, during those years. And in our house, uh, Franklin Donald Roosevelt was, you know, a god. I mean, he, he saved us. And amazingly enough, he was also a god in Ronald Reagan's house. Ronald Reagan's father had yeah. worked for the New yes. Deal. And I remember talking to Ronald Reagan about this, that, you know, uh, he he— to the end, Ronald Reagan had great respect for Roosevelt, and uh, and we you, talked you, about you the, spoke to you spoke to Reagan about Roosevelt. Yeah, I interviewed Reagan before he was governor and after he was governor and before he was president. I probably spent more time with Reagan than well, just about any other uh, journalist other than his official biographer. I got along with him, and uh, and you know Reagan. Uh, a complex figure, and at the end of his life, he actually did a couple of good things. Uh, you know, he extended the olive branch to Gorbachev and mm -hmm. wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons. And interestingly enough, even on economic stuff, he was so burned out about the savings and loan scandal that he actually tightened regulations on the bank by the end of his tenure, uh, as opposed to our guy Bill Clinton, who loosened them and sure. reversed the New Deal. So these are all complex, but I only bring Reagan up because it, it's sort of amazing. We had this high point of, of progressive idealism in America with a rich guy who could have been a conservative, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right. you know, from the ruling circles. And he, and he, he understood something very basic, uh, that for the society to survive, there has to be a common interest that is served. And that, of course, is what we've lost. And he understood you could not have this increasing division between the one percent and everyone else, and 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 so when I think about uh, progressives, I, I don't start with you know more recent history. I go back to what was basically progressive in the American tradition, and I go back to the framers of the Constitution, who who gave us an enormous gift, and that gift was the freedom to organize. That, that's the basic gift, the whole notion of limited government. Mm -hmm. And and what drove Jefferson and Madison and Tom Paine and all these people uh, was the – had to deal with the question, what happened to Rome? What happened to Spain? What happened to France? What happened to England? These were societies that held real promise in their eyes. They would read about them. They would thought about them. And they all degenerated. And then the question was, why? And they came up with two basic ideas that are the basic ideas in our Constitution. And I know there are a lot of folks who don't like to celebrate the framers. They're a bunch of white guys and they had limitations and we had slavery. And there's a lot of, you know, Howard Zinn wisdom and critiquing them. But there were two big ideas they had that actually go to the heart of what my book is all about and what our current crisis is all about. One is you can't be a representative republic and an empire in the same moment. If you're going to be meddling all over the world, if you're going to be going after the resources of the whole world, if you're going to be exploiting people all around the world in the name of saving them, you're going to go the route of Rome, you're going to crush the republic, which was what Rome was at its finest moment. And this was true of every society that they had seen, uh, particularly the one that was now that they were in rebellion against England, which after all had the Magna Carta, had notions of law, had you know uh, standards. So that was one big idea. And the other big idea they had was that government had to be viewed with suspicion, no matter the claim of government, whether it was the divine right to rule or was the great French civilization or the great Roman values. Uh, and the constitution that they gave us contained a really subversive notion. It said, beware of power, not as an abstraction, beware of the power that us folks, Jefferson, Madison, you know, uh, Washington, are about to assume. 
This was the whole idea of the separation of powers, of limited government, of checks and balances, and the incorporation of the Bill of Rights. And the Fourth Amendment. Of course, the Fourth Amendment, because that's necessary to the First Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, which says that you have to have privacy, individual sovereignty, and this came from English common law, which the king then violated in the colonies, but the basic principle, and you can trace it to the Magna Carta, was that, that the king of England, with all his claim on divine power, Power, could not enter the home of the humblest peasant without a specific reason and due process and a court order, and that he could not rummage about in the possessions and ideas and, uh, of, of the humblest peasant. And so when the King of England was doing that here in the colonies to try to get people on their taxes or whatever they were getting them on or whether they were committing revolution or what have you, uh, this is, was the spark that started the American Revolution. And the Fourth Amendment is critical to why you have a First Amendment. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have that freedom to think and to assemble in your own home, have your own papers, your own possessions, your own sanctuary, you're not going to have the freedom of speech and the right to assemble in the free press that's guaranteed in the First Amendment. So they understood that connection. All right? And what has happened... Uh, is that the first betrayed the second in certainly our recent history, that our meddling around the world, our involvement in Afghanistan and everywhere else created a situation of great hostility and animosity and instability in Afghanistan and elsewhere. We got al-Qaeda, we got all this blowback and so forth. And then in response to this attack of 9-11, they then began to destroy all of the notions of limited government. And the upshot is, instead of our the citizens being in the position to be protected in our observation of government, our ability to challenge government, they turned that suspicion against us. So the government is protected as our great savior, and we the people are the potential enemy. We're the traitors. We're the potential terrorists. Well, when you say first and second, you mean the first, the, the first sort of basic underlying assumptions that you, that you outlined. I think these are the great gifts of the American political experiment. So the the republic, not expanding into empire, and, 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 and government, and, and being suspect of government power. Yes, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the, it, the notion is really not the word privacy, it's sovereignty of the individual. The individual cedes power to the state, and that power has to be exercised in a way that's responsible and that the people can be. And so in order for the people to be able to check that power, they have to be informed and that's one problem with going to war. The truth becomes the first casualty. You can't get the information, and they can, you can be lied to with impunity. Uh, and so you, you, and, you can, and, and your rights can be in, invaded upon as well. Yes, yes. And then you have the Alien Sedition Act, and you have uh, classification. And you know, when we go invade Iraq because there's weapons of mass destruction, which there are not, or we do Milai in Vietnam to bring them freedom. Instead, we're massacring them. And so truth. Uh, is destroyed, and you lose the main ingredient for a democracy, which is an informed public. And so then you end up with people that are very similar uh, to being as they were in Iraq when the women were voting with their f purple stained fingers up in the air. They were voting how the Ayatollah told them or somewhere, but, you know, it was pretense at freedom because they didn't have information, they weren't empowered, they didn't have fundamental rights to redress grievances, to speak, to have a free press. And, you know, that's what happened after 9-11. We sacrificed this whole legacy that we had been protecting and developing, and it just went out the window. Well, Bob, as you heard the introduction to the show, you know that a lot of what we want to do here is talk to organizers, talk to people that are working in the progressive movements. So can I step back a bit and ask you some questions about your own life and how you wound up doing this work as a writer and a journalist? Well, you know, I, I, it's funny because usually when you're an older guy, you're supposed to sit around and, and answer those questions and uh, write your memoir and everything. And I'm, I'm very much engaged in the issues of, of, of our time and the I moment. Know, I know. And uh, I think that's a healthier w way to live, uh, frankly. 
but when when I'm pressed about this, and I am a teacher, I do teach in the university. I have 400 or so students a year, and I'll be teaching tonight after I talk to you. And so you have to get into these kind of questions, you know. And uh, I teach an ethics class actually tonight. We'll get into some hot and heavy discussion. That's a, that's a USC. I USC, believe, right? but we'll talk about uh, racism in fraternities, as the recent Oklahoma case. We'll talk about gay rights and the fact that our athletic director at USC said he's not going to attend this NCAA meeting because he has a gay son, Pat Aiden, famous yeah. football player, oh, yeah. and took a strong position on that. So we'll talk a lot, and we'll talk about, you know, uh, Edward Snowden, and we'll talk about secrecy. So these issues come up, and then so every once in a while, yes, I get back into thinking about my own life, and I think there's a couple, you know, points. That, that one, one way the, the left, particularly the new left, was dismissed is we were all supposed to be a bunch of spoiled people who didn't have to face real jobs, you know, like the workers with the you know, construction hats on and so forth. We also and, didn't have to walk uh, four miles in the snow to school yeah, every day. Yeah. Well, I did walk in the snow to school. But anyway, you know, in my own life, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I was born in 1936. I was born at the height of depression. And because my father lost his job and didn't get it back for about four years, we lived on welfare. And, uh, you know, my father worked for the WPA and all that sort of thing on different projects. And my mother was a garment worker. My father was a machinist and garment worker running big knitting mill machines and setting needles and all that. So I had a lot of reality in my life. And then, of course, the war was there, and you saw your relatives, your cousins and everything uh, go off to this war. And then we had a war memorial in the project uh, that I grew up in. And then when people died, their name was added to this role, and you had Gold Star Mothers. So, you know, and, and in that war, there was a particular personal connection. Uh, my father was a German Protestant, of German Protestant background, and he was a father boy and he came here just at the before first world war and uh so we had a lot of german relatives on that side of the family and they spoke with a heavy accent and then my mother was jewish and her family came from lithuania and they all were wiped out and she'd already had two of her sisters killed in in the, in the Russian Revolution and you know, uh, the Tsar and all that, and she came here when she was 21. So there I was, and uh, and dealing or uh, trying to comprehend the war. You know, as a kid, you play war games, you burn Hitler's house, you're killing Krauts. But my father was a Kraut. You know, uh, he was a German. He had an accent, but he was a strong anti-fascist. He was a lefty sort of guy. He was, you know, the Union movement. Been a in, in the Bronx, in the Bronx. Yeah, in the Bronx. Well, he worked in Manhattan, down on Little West 12th Street at the New York Knitting Mill, mm -hmm. uh, a place that when I went to pick up one of the Webbies that we've won with Truth Dig, the magazine, I edit, uh, and uh, uh, I could. Uh, the, one of the ceremonies takes place at the Standard Hotel there, which is now a gentrified area of Manhattan. And from the bathroom, actually, I could look out this picture window and see uh, the brick building that my father spent 25 years in running these big knitting mill uh, machines and setting the needles and everything. And he had a stroke at the machine and dragged himself up to the Bronx on the subway and then died a few days later. Uh, so I, 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 I know something about that. Uh, part of life, and I dealt with the what George Washington in his farewell address warns us about the impostures of pretended patriotism. I, I know the hypocrisy about war. I know how it, the mood changes. I know how the, suddenly the Second World War was over and the Russian allies became the Russian enemies and, uh, you know, and jingoism dominated and simplicity and stupidity entered. And as a kid, I struggled with a lot of these questions. What was nationalism? What was loyalty? What, you know, why do people do what they do? And then after the war, my brother, who I didn't know well, my half-brother, but he had been a bomber in the war. The Germans were trusted in a way that Japanese-Americans were not. Uh, they were, German Americans were the largest immigrant group. So uh, people like my brother, Arnold, uh, fought in Germany. My, my, so my brother bombed our hometown in Germany. And after the war, I went to Germany. I found my father's brother. I found the family and raised these questions. How did the most modern, advanced, scientific uh, society, in which actually Jews were in a much better situation in Germany than they'd been in Eastern Europe, uh, you know, and uh, I asked the question, how did they descend into the most incredible barbarism of modern history? And, and the answer was, you know, it raised the question that was raised in a couple of books at the time, can it happen here? 
Could it happen here? And that question has always uh, bothered me because I do think it can happen here and that we have to be on, on guard against it. And this whole thing that's happened after 9-11, we associate madness uh, with Muslims, with people who live in the Mideast. We have this little cop-out. Uh, but the fact is the greatest madness did not come from Muslims. It came from people who were basically Christian, uh, were well-educated, were, uh, were Germans uh, primarily, but plenty of people who outside of Germany who shared those values, who went along. So when you ask me where I came from, my suspicion, my my uh, reason I love being a journalist, and you know I can challenge, I can question, uh, think about things in a different way, came very early to me because I had to think about what what what, what was this all this madness and how did it connect in a personal way? How to start writing? Me. How to start writing? Well, it was interesting. Another thing that's made me sort of sympathetic to people <laughs> is that I had a pretty serious uh, learning uh, issue. And uh, I couldn't uh, learn uh, foreign languages. I couldn't learn cursive. Those days you were required to write with cursive. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't write my own name. I had some blocks. And I was good at some other stuff. I was very good at math and science. And so I had a disconnect. And one of the reasons I like teaching is I run into students that are good at some things and not at others. And you help them build strategies mm -hmm. For doing it. So the last thing in the world I ever expected to become was a writer or a journalist or anything. And so uh, I was saved in high school. I was I had a real hard time in part of my schooling. Uh, and then when I went to Christopher Columbus High School, I had flunked every subject in the 7th and 8th grade. So I was put in what was called the ungraded class, but most people refer to it as the moron class. And I was supposed to sit there until I was 18 and <clears throat> get out. And it was pretty rough in there, Christopher Columbus High School, and, you know, it's, uh, older kids that bang me over the head every once in a while. And then one day the teacher shouted, and then we didn't learn anything there. We were just supposed to be custodial, you know, sit there and not get in any trouble or anything. And then one day the teacher barked out my name, and we had taken some kind of test that everybody took. And it, now they decided that I was not a moron, and he sent me with a school monitor up three floors upstairs at Christopher Columbus High School to join what was called a co-curriculum class, but the students referred to it as the genius class. So I went from the morning well, how class. Did it, but did it just happen like that? Uh, no explanation at all. They sent me with a monitor with a big wooden wall pa a pass and go with him, take your stuff. So I took all my stuff and went from the zoo that I was in, not to denigrate people, but it was pretty scary, uh, up to a place where there was like eight kids sitting there around a table chatting with a very friendly teacher who called me Mr. Shear and said, welcome, Mr. Shear, and to the co-curriculum class, and here you'll do whatever you want. And I said, anything I want? I, she said, yes. Hey, I said, I want to go home. And <laughs> she, she said, you can go home. <laughs> she did. And I went home, and then a truant officer got me, you know, about four or five weeks later and dragged me back. And they put me in a regular slow class. And the guy who saved me in this whole thing, which is really a, a good story about education and the importance of education, of course, at the end of the day, we had a really great school system in New York, you know. And and uh, this one guy, he'd been in the Navy. R.B. Speed was his name. Uh, the initials R.B. Speed. Speed. And he had been some kind of naval officer and went back to high school teaching when, when the war was over. And he was a no-nonsense guy, and he taught the easier science class. Or it's, he taught every, all the science classes. But I went to the earth science, and I liked it. It was about gravity and all this stuff. And uh, he would give a, a, an objective test every Friday, you know, no essay or anything. And so I got 100 every time and then, you know, creamed it. And, and he could see that I had Well, you got 100 every time. Is that because you, you were a constant Well, there was reader? no essay. Yeah, you know, I had never trouble reading. I had trouble writing essays, and okay. I couldn't do cursive, and my spelling always sucked, and... You know, my sentences would jump all over the place. And so uh, he, I know his tests were, you know, measure specific gravity and what is this, you know, and so forth. And so I, uh, uh, anyway, so I was good at it and I enjoyed it because we were learning about, you know, things in the world and earth science. And so he took me aside and said, okay, and never had me sit down, never schmooze with me or anything. You know, he was all no nonsense guy. And he said, so you got to take physics next time, and then you go take ge geometry and take this. So he, he looked into my record, 
And then, so he was sort of my mentor. I don't know why I said sort of. He was he my was your mentor, mentor yeah. uh, for three years. And, and But it was never friendly. He never asked me anything, personal questions. He never asked me to sit down. Never invited me to his office. I don't even know if he had an office. But did he put a pen in your hand? When did you start one thing writing? He, one thing he did, he, he um, established sanity in this classrooms. That no one screwed with this guy. There wasn't any crap, yeah. and and including no uh, uh, ass kissing. There was no, you know, uh, you didn't have to be in the know what's going to be on the test and everything. And it was very straightforward. And so, and, and anyway, they gave uh, suddenly I was there were other tests. There were New York State had these regents, and so I got I don't know, you know, very high and the math regions and the physics and so forth. So then he took me aside, I think it was my junior year or something, and he said, um, look, you've got to go to college. And I was already working at Klein's in Union Square, you know, as a cashier or something, and I was, you know, I was a good hustler. I sold sodas at the Guardian and, you know, and uh, Yankee Stadium and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I was good in the streets. I had, you know, and in fact, with learning with dyslexia, they find gang leaders are good because they they have a nonverbal learning difference. Mm-hmm, and right. I, was, I was very good, which is why I'm going to be good on radio for you. You know, I could, you do verb- it. Yeah. yeah, I could verbalize and all, even when I was young. So I never thought I was stupid. I didn't by the description at all. And my parents were, you know, they didn't know what was going on at all because they were not familiar with the school system, but they liked me and they were supportive. And uh, and I left out a really key element. My father, when he came here, he was, I think, 14 or something. We're not quite sure. We found the manifest at Ellis Island, but he was somewhere between 13 and 15, and he really didn't know anybody. He was supposed to have an uncle, and he didn't like him. So my father had this idea. He would say to you as a kid, he said, when you work... You'll make your own decision. Meanwhile, now you'll leave everything on the table and you'll do the dishes after and you'll blah, blah, blah. So, you know, well, when I was 12 and a half, I, w- I was the poorest kid around that I knew because my father had another family. It wasn't like he wasn't hardworking, but mm-hmm. he, had, he had to support two other kids and another and a wife, and he wasn't legally married to my mother. My, it's basically we were living off my mother's garment worker salary. And then a job opened up delivering milk in the morning, like four in the morning. This grocer was trying to keep out the milk chains. So in this project, there were like w- no elevators. So this guy, Maya Rubich, and I was delivering orders for more ready, and he asked, he asked if I wanted to deliver milk in the morning. He was trying to keep the milk companies out. So he would leave all these cases of milk on the different corners around the project, and then I would take 12 in, in each hand in, in you know, a tray, go up to the top and drop off the fill ones and pick up the empties. But he was paying real money because no one else would do this job, and no parents would let any other kids do this job. You're out there at 4 or 5 in the morning doing this crap. And my father thought this was just great, you know, just great. And my father was really a man of his word. He said, when you make your own money, you're a man. And I'll never forget, two months, three months into that job, my my mother tried to tell me something, and my father said, Schreinisht, you know, German... Uh, you know, basically shut up. I mean, Schreinisch, uh, don't shout, you know, uh, he's a man and he says he's making his own money and he'll do what he wants to do. And he wants to go eat pizza, he'll eat pizza. And he wants to come home at two in the morning, he'll come home at two in the morning. My father said that. Yeah. And he stuck to it. And so when I was 16, I went and hitchhiked around the country, got different jobs. My father was, you know, like real cool with it. And uh, I remember in Chicago, I was arrested for vagrancy with a friend of mine and we were, had a hard time and I was uh, they were really kind of pushing us around but I got a phone call and I called home and my father I said I'm in this jail in Chicago and he said uh, yeah but what happened to your job and I said well you know I was, I was working in Levittown in Pennsylvania was what I was doing building houses and then fairly wait wait, wait. Levittown that's northeast Philly right uh, yeah yeah, and, and those were some of the early suburbs. Yeah, it that, was near that, Morristown, I think, and there right. was the Fearless Steel in, Plant. In the fifth, the book that Halperstam wrote, was it Halperstam about the 50? No. Well, he did write one. What is it about? Anyway, I, I remember the, those... That those that those complexes were considered sort of the new trend. And yeah, well, at Levittown. I, I I don't know. I think the New York one had already been built. I'm not sure. It, it had been. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But anyway, all I remember about Levittown is there was you put three boards, you know, one by sixes, and then three three by fours, and you hit three nails on each one, and it was hard as hell to do. And then uh, me and my buddy, we would lift that, put it in a pile, and put three more boards in this mold, and three of the others, and that was the basic unit of the whole. 
Levittown houses. But anyway, and, and I worked at Fearless Steel Plant that was there nearby Levittown. Yeah. And, and all that. And uh, I anyway. Lived, I lived in North Philly oh, as well. part of the lettuce boycott, if you can believe. Oh, well, then. And you, so you know I have. That area. Yeah. So anyway, well, it didn't work out. We ended up, we've, well, we've got as far as Chicago. But so my father said, what happened to the job? And I said, well, it was real hard. And I said, oh, couldn't make the job. He said, well, this is costing money. So uh, when you come back, tell me all about it. The phone calls making. Yeah, and he, he hung up. That was it. You know, hung up. And so we had to fend for ourselves. But when we got back, he listened to all my stories. He was very interested and, you know, fascinated, actually. And so he was consistent. And so, I don't know, to answer your question. I, I guess I've, you know, but the, here's, here's the question. Let me answer the question Go, in a please, way that, I, please. that informs my politics. And I got this real insight reading Colin Powell's book, of all people, because Colin Powell was in my class at City College. I've actually talked to him a little bit about this. And he was a, he, he's also from the Bronx, correct? Yeah, and he was an engineering student as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's from two subway stops away. He was 177th Street. I was out in the avenue. And uh, in his book, though, he evokes that time in a way that I couldn't have written it better myself. And what was done for us, his whole point was that we were the privileged kids because that's the last time America really cared about the poor. You know, it wasn't Lyndon Johnson's poverty program. We had the settlement houses. We had City College was a free university where you were given textbooks. You didn't even have to. Then my class, when we came in by then, we had to buy them at a reduced rate. But you, you really, you know, you had a shot. You had schools that worked. You had neighborhood support. Uh, you had union programs that, that helped you out. Like I went to summer camp because the faux workers had, uh, you know, would help you out or the garment workers union or something. Uh, you had health care that was supplied either by the government, by the unions, the combination. So I witnessed all of that stuff working. And that's what Colin Powell describes rather brilliantly in, in his book. And... Uh, then, over the years, I saw that deteriorate. Uh, it got sacrificed to the Vietnam War. It got sacrificed to greed. Uh, the union movement was destroyed. The union movement was the savior of our life. You know, uh, it's what, what gave people a sense of, of dignity and a possibility of success. Every, uh, on my father's side of the family, I'm the first one that went to college. And, but my cousins, they, they had good jobs. They were tool and die workers. They were machinists. Uh, they went to work for the airlines, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was a real, I mean, no, it wasn't true for blacks, and it wasn't true as much for Puerto Ricans and so forth. But for, you know, these were white guys, and they had an, a ladder. They had a ladder up. And, uh, you know, over the years, I saw that disintegrate, you know, beginning with Taft-Hartley, the attacks on the labor unions and everything. Uh, so, you know, that whole idea of a good union job and a good attitude and you'll get ahead, that went by the wayside. And so, you know, my whole outlook really is basically don't mess around. I, I'll tell you, the slogan I have as a, a journalist I've used is I want to know who's getting screwed and who's doing the screwing. My whole thing that's right that's there. That's the first question. That's it. That's the first and it's the last question. That's what I'm after. You know, what's going on? You know, who's getting the dirty end and who's giving it to them? You know, and uh, uh, that, that is, is the passion that drives it, you know, and uh, most of the time I've been able to get it right. I'm rather proud of my work. Uh, when I don't get it right, I surround myself with people who are quite critical, including my sons and others. And so I hear from them, my wife and Mm -hmm. you know, several wives and uh you know so i i don't shun criticism i don't you know uh, uh, assume that everything's going well and i can tell you when i write you want to get to the writing thing i don't know how i started writing i write i wrote because i had something to say and uh, i was and do you remember your very first published anything oh yeah no i remember it very clearly um what happened was i uh so anyway, I went to graduate school after City College, and I ended up in Berkeley, and I ended up in the Center for Chinese Studies at one point. And then in the summer, um, I guess it was 1960, I went back to teach at City College and during the summer break. I but was, you, you were out in Berkeley before that? Yeah. Said, I, okay. Well, what happened was I, after City College, and while I went to City College, I should mention, it, I... I I had a lot of real-life experience because the only way I could go to college 
was to work in, in the post office sure. or something. And post office was a pretty good job. Not, not a pretty good, it was a great job. Yeah. And um, if I can brag, I'll tell you something that's interesting about the adversity, but uh, while I was in the post office, I was a temporary, part-time, permanent sub, if you can believe such a thing. And, uh, you know, all the classifications got bigger. And I didn't have veterans points because a lot of guys had come back from World War II sure. and they got extra points on the postal test. And we had to study schemes. You know, we didn't have zip codes in those days. So you, actually, my brother-in-law who lives with me now, he works out in the post office near the airport. And it's not all that different. Than that. We kid around about it in the morning because he, he works the graveyard shift. He comes in at 7 and 8. And, he, I, and we still I still remember, I have nightmares about scenes because we'd be facing up mail, you know, the short ones and the bigger ones back and get the stamps canceled and then a chute would open up and when you cleared the whole table and more mail would drop particularly around Christmas time so we, we actually kidded around about it this morning at 8 o'clock when he came in uh, you know did they open the chute you know one last time yeah. and you thought you were going to get out of there and so but I would work in the post office and it was a great education because a lot of these guys were vets they'd been in World War II and some of them had been in the Korean War you know and uh, there I am you know this kid and uh you know, but I wanted to hold on to the job, and they gave this test, uh, and if you didn't do well on it, you were going to be drummed out, and uh, so my adrenaline flowed, and as a result, I got my picture in the Civil Service Leader and the Journal of America and these papers as the smartest postman in New York. Whoa. I had scored the highest <laughs> on this test, so I then became the brain in the post office, and people would tell me about their marital troubles, and what should they do about their taxes, and everything else, you know. And, and so it was quite an education to be there because I was there for I don't know, three, going on four years. I was there a long time. and But it allowed me to, you know, I ended up getting married while I was going to college and the whole thing so I could pay my bills and help my mother out, you know, who was still working in the garment district. My father had died. And, uh, and, and that whole going to college but working down here in the post office was a great balance, you know. Sure. And, and it really informed my attitude as a as a student, you know, what I was studying and what I cared about. And I switched out at the end from engineering into economics, and I ended up going to Berkeley in graduate school. I took a Greyhound bus out to California, and uh, it was quite interesting. I even got off in Coeur d'Alene in Wallace, Idaho, and checked out where the Wobblies had been, and, you know, got, got, got off the bus and then got back on another a couple of days later. And so it was great. I have always loved California. I loved California whole atmosphere and uh did you get involved in the free speech so i'm going yeah so of course i was in in all that stuff but i was going to explain about writing yeah Uh, please (laughs) so then in the in the summer of of 60 uh i went to back to city college which i love it's the one institution in this country i've always loved and i'm i'm remiss because I'm, i'm behind on my alumni contributions uh, not that they're so big, but it's the one thing I, I want to support. I'm now in the City College Hall of Fame of, uh, of journalists. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I really do care about that institution. And I believed in it. It was, for me, the center of sanity in the world. This yeah. college in the middle of Harlem, and I just loved it. Built with the granite from when they dug up the subway. And <clears throat> what happened was... Um, When I went back there to teach that summer, it was fun. And then I saw a sign. I was married already to a girl I knew from Brooklyn. And she got to Brooklyn College. And there was a sign that said, if you want to go to Cuba, this is the Cuban Revolution that happened January 59. This is the summer of 60. So it's a year and a half after the Cuban Revolution. Castro had come up to Harlem and plucked chickens and the whole damn thing. So I uh, saw the sign that said, if you can get yourself to Key West, you can go into Cuba for 25 bucks a week and pick cotton or what not cotton sugar sugar <laughs> sugar <laughs> do something i don't know what you could do so anyway I, I talked to my wife and then by then we had a little volkswagen 56 volkswagen so anyway so we drove yeah, down i think a, i bought it 10 years later oh, but that's did. all right so all right. We, we drove it down to key west got on a little plane with a bunch of american legion guys going out to get laid in havana and gamble and everything it was still you could still go back and forth mm-hmm. you know like that and uh so we get there, and it was an interesting experience. Of course, that's when they put in the economic blockade, and I was there in, uh, I think, September, October uh, of 60. And I, Anyway, I saw that, and there was still a, a really good ferment and an openness. There was, mm-hmm. uh, 
you know, they were publishing The Beats and Allen Ginsberg and everybody, you know, it was a kind of wild place. So I got back to Berkeley and uh, I was really interested in what was going on in Cuba, but I was at the China Center and I knew I couldn't go to China because there was, you know, it was impossible to go travel there, but I had just experienced some kind of, you know, taste of, of some kind of communism in Cuba with Castro and the Cold War. And so I teamed up with a guy named Maurice Seitlin, who was a very Marie good... Maurice Seitlin? That's you know, why is that familiar to me? Well, he wrote, wrote a lot of books. He's a sociologist. He was at UCLA for a long time. He had been a... Pre- I know. I think... Is it, would it be possible that I know him? Yeah. I mean, if you read... I think he was an activist in some of the early rent control stuff in Santa Monica. Yes, for sure. Then for I knew... Sure. Mar- I know him. Yeah. Well, you would have known him if you... I mean, he was very involved in the anti-war movement in, in, uh, at Berkeley. And, mm-hmm. But he wrote very important books. He wrote about labor economics and he wrote about unions. Very important sociologist in the C. Wright Mills School of Sociology. And uh, anyway, wh- when I knew him, he was just getting his doctorate at Berkeley and he was on his way to teach at Princeton and then he ended up being a lifelong professor at UCLA. Yeah. Doing very important work. Still alive, still around. And so we teamed up, and he one day after, I wrote an article after Enos Cosby got shot getting off the freeway, you know, uh, Bill Cosby's son, and he mm-hmm. had a learning disability, he was getting his doctorate in, in teaching and in, in education. And, uh, and so when he died, I wrote a column, I came out <laughs> as a person who had learning disability, and I wrote about his death, and I was happy to be covering Carter's inauguration, second inauguration, I think. And so I had to write that story, and I was freaking out because I didn't know where my wife was or my normal support system of people who check my stuff out, sometimes my son, even my 13-year-old son, uh, Peter, and others. And so anyway, I, I just opened up, and I said, look, I've had this problem, which is why I studied engineering in the first place. And, uh, and and Maurice read that, and I remember his saying, I now understood what happened when we wrote that book. We wrote a book called U.S. Uh, Cuba, American Tragedy, mm-hmm. or Tragedy in Our Hemisphere, Penguin and Grove Press were the publishers. And he said, when we were writing that book, he said, you were dictating most of your part. You know, you were <laughs> you know, dictating whole chapters, and we were, you know, and he was writing it, and it was like this crazy uh, enterprise. And yeah, I, you know, I never claimed to be a writer. And then I, what happened, the reason writing came up was because it was an avenue you could do. And so I disciplined myself to get control of the grammar. And, and then computers came along, and that really lifted this tremendous. But that period. was your, your first published piece was about, It was a book, yeah, was, about the Cuban Revolution. And then I went to Vietnam, and uh, Paul Krasner, who was editing the Realist magazine, uh, I went up to him in Greenwich Village. I, I knew him and uh, I actually wrote something for the realist, but I said I wanted to go to Vietnam and he had just made a bundle of money uh, off selling these uh, fuck communism posters. They were red, white, and blue. Yeah. There were these things and people hung them up in their dorm because you know, the dean wouldn't let you use the word fuck, but on the other hand, he liked the idea you said fuck communism, so it was a great contradiction. And he was selling these things like hotcakes. And so he wrote out a check for $1,350, uh, which was the price of a ticket to Vietnam. And so I went. And then I published my next thing, which was uh, how the U.S. got involved in Vietnam. And it, this relates to the current book that I have because that's how I got involved with Ramparts Magazine. What? And I left graduate school and, and it was all about how the CIA had infiltrated student organizations and uh, taken over these things and, and to propagandize for our getting into Vietnam. And so that was my first uh, uh, counter the surveillance society yeah. story and that's what ra- ra- made Ramparts famous. I want to get into that, and, and we will get into that in just a second. I want to take a little bit of a short break, but I want to also make a, a couple of quick comments. Uh, and my God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, and thank you for that wonderful story of your life. And I want to tell you about, and I don't, I don't know if you've heard of this, but I was watching one of my MSNBC shows last night. I think it was on Rachel Maddow. No, it was on Chris Matthews. Do you know about this book that just was written by Alan Alda's wife about the Bronx? No. I don't want you to buy it. I, will, I want to buy it for you. Okay. It's a series of stories. Alan, I guess Alda, and I don't remember his wife's name, 
but you know Alan Alda, the actor. Yeah, I was Nash. on a committee with Alan Alda and uh, oh god, what's her name? Anna Maria Tayano, Anne Bancroft, and Mrs. Uh, Robinson. Yeah, Mrs. Robinson, and oh, what's her husband? She's name? twenty-eight years old when she did that role, by the way. Yeah, what's her husband's? Uh, oh, um, uh, Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Yeah. yeah. So a- Anna Maria Tayano, who then became Anne Bancroft, was ahead of me at Columbus High School in the Bronx, and so she, I knew all about her. And then one day I was uh, giving a commencement speech out at Crossroads High School in... In, in Santa Monica. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul Cummings' great school that he mm-hmm. founded. And she and Mel Brooks were the parents' committee. They were the speakers. Mm-hmm. And I was the commencement speaker. So they spoke, and it was nice. And then I gave up to my speech. You know, I was doing my, my number about, you know, economic justice and, you know, everything. And she started screaming behind me, you tell him, you tell him, tell him what it was like, you know, and everything. And when the thing was over, she and Mel Brooks came up and said, we want you to run for president, you know, we'll back you every inch of the way. So it was like this great Bronx moment. And then I, at that time, we were we were involved with trying to save the Bronx or help the Bronx, you know. And so that's I, I know the crowd out here that's always felt well, nostalgic. I'm going to buy you this, and I, I, I apologize, I don't remember the name of it, but it's this great set of stories. And I remember when they talked about it, and I just saw it last night when they talked about it. He that, that's they mentioned that that Colin Powell was from the Bronx. Yeah. And so I know this is a book you really like. I want to get into the. I want to get into this this new book you, that that you've written, which I've spent some time on. Um, uh, and there was another there was another comment I was going to make, um, but I'll hold on that for now. So this is Radio Titans. We're here with Bob Shear, um, learning about the past as it may become the future. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Radio Titans, the campaign with Ernie Powell. Got a man in Soho, couldn't guess his age. I found his empty journal. I filled up every page I called up my state senator They said he wasn't there The secretary took my name And man, she sounded scared So I counted my misfortunes I added up the blame I picked through all the garbage I checked off all the names I read in the newspaper They questioned all my friends They hoped that they could find my ass Before I struck again So I sang to myself Must travel, it's end I cannot see. And so when thirsty I will drink, and when hungry I will steal. But the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see. And so tonight I walk in anger with worn shoes on my feet. And the road I must travel, it's end I cannot see. And I will sing to myself that I'm gonna be free. But the road I must travel. Okay, welcome back. This is Ernie Powell. This is the campaign with Ernie Powell. I've got Robert Shear, Bob Shear, who's here, who's um, who I've been reading since the beginning of time. You know, I just want to reflect on a couple. You, you were talking a lot about New York just now. Well, that's your your birthplace in the Bronx. A couple of things. I moved um, from Sacramento to to Washington a couple of years ago, and I had it made me look through some old boxes. And guess what I found. I found the ticket stub to, New, to to a Yankees game in 1965. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Detroit versus Detroit versus it was a home game. Yankees versus Detroit. Good seats. Guess how much they cost? Eight dollars. Three dollars and fifty cents. Hey, can I tell you a baseball story? Please. That really would fit into explaining me. Uh, for some perverse reason, growing up, I was a St. Louis Cardinal fan. In New York. Yeah. And I think it was only because everybody in my part, where I was, was a Yankee fan, and they were always winning. And then my relatives in Brooklyn, they were all Dodger fans. And I didn't like the Giants for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, they were in Manhattan. And I, so I had this weird little thing, you know. Uh, and, and then, I don't know if you remember, but in 1946, the Cardinals were playing the Red Sox in the World Series. Cardinals with Stan Musial, mm-hmm. Whitey Dugowski, uh, Marty Marion, I'm sure, mm-hmm. you know, Red Shandies. I could tell you the whole team right now. And so Ted I, Williams was on was on the Red Sox. Yeah. So. yeah, and and you didn't have television obviously, and so you'd listen on some squawky little radio and uh, you know f- try to follow this. So you know if you, you really had to be into this. And I was the only Cardinal fan. Nobody ever had met a Cardinal fan. So it was the beginning of my radicalism or something. You know. 
and it was great. And you know, Enos Slaughter hit that in the park home run. You know, and, yeah. and uh, and that we won. You know, and it was, I just was thrilled. And there was nobody to celebrate. Nobody gave it there. Anyway, the next year, and and because my my family we were kind of union radical type people, my uncle in Brooklyn, my uncle Edward, took me to picket Ebbets Field at around that time. And my uncle want, was, was urging them to hire Negro baseball players. And that was his one of his things. He was a big sports fan. He was a welder, you know, a German-American guy and everything. And, but he was very anti-racist. And uh, so I remember this improbable, crazy thing. My uncle, who usually would take me fishing out in Long Island or something, takes me to a picket line at Ebbets Field. I don't even care about it. I was feeling the Dodgers. Anyway, the next year, uh, Jackie Robinson comes in. Now, in my little crowd of friends, I had a Negro friend, a guy named Carl Jurgens. His uncle was a well-known painter, actually, Max Jurgens. And where I lived in the Bronx, you had some interracial couples that you either could live in Greenwich Village or you lived up where I lived with this fur workers, mm -hmm. uh, cooperative housing and everything. So they were... But, you know, I had some familiarity with race. And my friend Carl, you know, we all knew he was the best athlete in every sport that was around there. And he couldn't play. And baseball was his sport. But he couldn't go think about going into the majors or anything. Sure. I mean, you know, and and uh, he ended up being a pretty good athlete. And uh, so I remember when Jackie Robinson came in. It was a really big deal in our crowd and everything, you know. And I don't know if you remember, but in that movie on Jackie Robinson, the recent movie, they stressed much, mostly the Philadelphia hostility to him, right? Right. There was the manager uh, sitting on the standing over on the sidelines, just giving him all kinds of yeah. Rancor. But that's not the way I remember. Though I didn't follow it that closely. The worst team were the Cardinals, because they were the most southern team. And in those days, teams took on the disposition or the attitude of their community. They didn't move, live everywhere mm -hmm. else. And so the Cardinals were the southernmost team. Well, when the Dodgers went there, they let out a black cat. It's my team. They, they're mm -hmm. on the field. And my hero, Enos Slaughter, the hero of the 46 World Series, spiked Jack, deliberately spiked Jackie Robinson, going around first base. I think they showed that scene. I remember that scene. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but you, what trauma. And my friends, everybody said, you know, this is your team. You know, yeah. this is your team. How can they do this? You know, what is this? You know, and I, I remember feeling personally responsible yeah. for, for, for this. And it was really a, an eye-opener to, to this day. And then, you know, years later, I went, I mean, 1960 was my first trip through the Deep South. And I got, got involved in some civil rights stuff, which we could talk about if you ever want to talk about it. But I'll, I remember that 1946 World Series and then that disillusionment the year after. Did, and and it, how did you resolve that in terms of your favorite team and the feeling towards the team? Well, uh, first of all, it made me under, really deal with racism at an early age on a really gut level, particularly because one of my, one of my you know, two or three closest friends was, sure. was uh, a Nobody talked about black people, then it was Negro. Right. You know, and, uh, you know, it just challenged all sorts of notions of rooting for the home team or rooting and, you know, blind. You know, I still go to ball games. I go to Laker games and I go to Oakland Raider games, but, but uh, I never done it with the same kind of <laughs> abandon I had back then. It was, it was really something. Are the Cardinals still your favorite team? No, 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 no. I dropped them after that. I Who is your them. favorite team? No, no. I mean, well, I, I kind of, I still actually like the Dodgers and I like the A's. But the game, I don't really go to those games. I find it a little too boring, baseball. And, you know, uh, I, well, I go to occasional Dodge game. I go to the A's. But my main thing is I have Lakers season tickets. I go to those games because I live downtown and I can walk over to Staples Center. And then I, I, I'm an Oakland Raider nut case. I, I like the Raiders and I'm very worried they might do move down here and leave Oakland. I ran for Congress in Oakland and Berkeley. I read so about I, that, yeah. Yeah, so I have. And you did pretty well, actually. Yeah, I. I, I came dangerously close to winning, I say. And then Ron Dellums ran after, and he got the seat, and he was a great congressman, and he gave me a lot of credit for inspiring him to run. Uh, I went up, I went to him and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the guy for this. You are. So anyway, it's a whole other story. They know everything about you, how data, collective, how data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. How'd you come to this? Well, it actually goes back to those Rampart years. You know, when I was there, 
we did a big story on how the CIA had abused its power. It was not supposed to be involved in domestic politics. By the way, Cy Hirsch, a whole bunch of people wrote for Ramparts back right. then. And and we established our you know significance by doing these stories others didn't want to do, which was basically the uh, abuse of power by the FBI, which after all went after Martin Luther King, tried to destroy him, the CIA, which got involved in domestic American life and so forth. And so uh, I've always been interested in this question of classification, national security, what does the FBI do, you know, and what, what are our protections against it? And so it's not a new story for me. And then in the 90s, when Clinton did this awful thing of reversing Glass-Steagall in cooperation mm -hmm. with the Republicans uh, in the Congress, Phil Graham and the others, an issue of privacy came up right then because what, what these banks wanted, the insurance companies, started with Travelers Insurance and Citibank merging to form Citigroup. And what they wanted was to grab all this data. Now, this was before the full flowering of supercomputers and data mining and the Internet. But still, they were able to gra grab a lot of data. And they wanted to take your medical records and everything else from the insurance companies and your investment records and your banking records and merge it so they can more effectively target you with advertising mm -hmm. and sales and so forth. And some folks uh, then... <coughs> And, and it's been bipartisan, this concern about privacy. One was William Sapphire, who had been Nixon's speechwriter, and he was now an, a columnist at the New York Times. Another was Ed Markey, who is a senator now from Massachusetts, right, a junior senator to Elizabeth Warren, and uh, but he was concerned about this. And they said to Clinton, you know, you should veto this bill if there isn't privacy protection. Because this is people's data, and why are you letting them all commingle it? And the banking lobby defeated them, and the banking lobby said, no, we don't even want this mergers if we can't get the data, and they won. And that's where it, that opened the door. And that was the end of the 1990s. And so I wrote about that, and at the time I wrote a, I was writing a lot, and I was teaching at USC. I was a columnist at that point in the LA Times, so I was covering all this stuff. And uh, I wrote a, a cover story for Yahoo Internet Life, which was one of the first times, that, you know, it was still a print magazine, but it was describing the Internet sure. world, and I was teaching this stuff, and it was all about privacy. And I said, what's going on now is a dictator's wet dream, you know. This is what Stalin or, or <clears throat> Hitler, uh, this is, they couldn't even imagine this kind of power, this kind of knowledge. You know, if you think about it, Martin Luther King, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover, and it wasn't just Hoover, it was Sullivan and it was Deke DeLoach, all the top guys, went out to destroy the greatest human rights worker we've had in American history and, and one of the greatest in world history. And they went out to destroy him by getting stuff from his personal life and manufacturing <laughs> stuff and adding stuff and everything. Well, their means were very limited then. You got to follow somebody physically or park a car outside their house or get the hotel room right next door and listen through the door or physically tap into the phone lines and so forth. By today's standard, that was chicken feed. I mean, you, you know, uh, and the guy, people being followed, they pretty much figured out they were being followed and, you know, could reserve the conversation if if the fbi had had the tools that, that now then that they have now there would be martin luther king would just been blown away and i think people have run into trouble now because they do have the tools i think of uh, elliot spitzer who was the governor of, of new york and and had been the most effective critic of the wall street and then they find them with prostitutes or something and he's finished uh, you think of uh you know, uh, Scott Ritter, who was the Marine who exposed the fact that there weren't the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and they get him in some kind of internet sex site or something mm -hmm. and destroy him. He goes, spends time in jail for years, you know, uh, over a victimless crime. It was a cop on the other end, you know, pretending to be someone else. And so, you know, my feeling is that the means that they have now uh, basically destroy any security anyone could have that they're not being observed all the time. And if you're being observed all the time, you don't have that zone of privacy that the founders assumed you would have to be able to have your thoughts, your association, your friends, and so forth. And, and what happened was that it was a marriage of the private sector and the government. 
And and because people thought they were only dealing with private companies, how do I find the best restaurant, the best movie? How do I, you know, blah, blah. blah. Oh, yes, can we use your location? Sure, you can use my location. Now with the iPhone 6, can you have my thumbprint? Yeah, here's my thumbprint 100 times a day. And, you know, oh, I bought that book. How far did you read in that book, you know? Oh, you bought that underwear. What is your underwear size? Oh, what medicine did you take? Oh, you saw a shrink. Uh, Oh, you voted, uh, you know, or... You know, what music did you listen to? So there, there's just everything is under observation. The data is then because of supercomputers and massive storage and so forth. You can data mine. You can you, you can take the eyeball, a picture of, of the eyeball from, from a, a shot of camera, and you can compare 20 million people and, and, and find somebody in, in, in an hour. Let me, let me read from two sections of the yeah. book, and I want you to comment on it if you would, Bob. Axiom, the second largest company involved in what is known as data marketing, has has um, has monitored the records of hundreds of millions of Americans, obtained obtained uh, 1.1 billion browser cookies through 1.1 billion browser cookies, 200 million mobile profiles, and an average of 1,500 pieces of data per customer, according to Axiom's first quarter 2014 report. And that report. Ambitious CEO Scott uh, Scott Howe noted, "Our digital reach will soon approach nearly ever every internet user in the U.S." The Transportation Security Agency, for example, purchases data from data brokers to pre-screen air travelers. Um, another another note from your book: um, the NSA tracks the locations of hundreds of millions of cell phones per day, allowing them to map people's movements and relationships in detail. Domestically, the NSA collects and stores metadata records of phone calls, including 120 million U.S. Verizon subscribers, as well as an Internet communications relying on a secret interpretation of the Patriot Act, whereby the entirety of the U.S. communications may be considered relevant to a terrorism uh, to a terrorism investigation, if it is expected that even a tiny minority may retire to terrorism. Yep. Mind-boggling. Yeah, it's mind-boggling, but it also doesn't make you any safer. That's the, the, the big lie here, is that this has something to do with national security. And, and the big cop-out was, they said after 9-11, and a lot of people said it, but Mostly people in these security agencies uh, said, whoa, look at this attack. No one else has been attacked like this. This is horrendous and so forth. The fact of the matter is, in the, in the grand scheme of things, this was a rather minor attack. Mm-hmm. Um, other nations have been conquered. They've been enslaved. They've had people thrown into concentration camps. They've had their whole major cities destroyed. Uh, They've been through terrible wars, terrible chaos, terrible mayhem. We have the strongest country in the world. We have the biggest military. We spend more on the military than all other countries combined. Uh, We are, there's never been a country more secure than ours, uh, more dominant in, in the world. And we have no existential threat except what we do to ourselves, you know, uh, and, and there is a big existential threat from nuclear weapons, and we've done very little uh, to discourage the proliferation of nuclear weapons and, and in fact, have taken our eye off that ball. But, but the fact of the matter is there was no excuse for this hysteria, this absolute panic to pass the Patriot Act without even reading it, without any serious discussion. And, in, in, uh, in a, you know, in a very short time, we abandoned the basic assumption of this society, which is that freedom is not a luxury. Freedom is a necessity to sound governance. If you can't check power, if you can't raise questions about it, you're going to be led astray. And we've been led astray. And the fact is, when Barack Obama was pushed after the Snowden revelations to defend this program, which, by the way, if this program is needed, why don't they tell us it is? Why don't they defend it openly? Why don't they tell us what they're doing? It's not like terrorists can't assume the worst. They assume everything is being taped and tracked and so forth. They're not stupid. But if you want to grab all of our data, 
why not tell us what you're doing? And if we don't like it, we'll vote you out of office. We'll challenge you. Uh, they didn't trust us with any information. But when Barack Obama was pressed to come up with an example of where this may be safe, he came up with only one example. It's discussed in the book in great detail, the Minyar case, the 19th hijacker in San Diego. And the record is quite clear from the 9-11 Commission and everything else we have that this fellow was living at the house of an FBI informant whose job was to inform on foreigners like Minda, uh, that he also was on the CIA radar, that these two agencies didn't compare notes, but he was operating on a legal passport. He was coming and going out of the country. And uh, you could have kept tabs on him. There was no obstacle. You wanted to know about that phone call he made to Yemen? AT&T would have given it to you in two minutes if you requested it. It's all garbage. If you take the two most prominent cases we have, uh, the Boston Marathon uh, bombing uh, or the Charlie Hebdo cartoonist massacre mm -hmm. in, in France, in both cases, the people accused of these crimes were well known to the police. In Paris, the Charlie Hebdo guy, one of them had already served time. You know, all you had to do is old-fashioned police work. What are these guys up to now? What have they been doing lately? The people who did the Boston Marathon, they, they were, you know, concerned about Chechnya. That was their passion. Uh, they had left a trail that was so clear. Uh, they had come to the attention of the authorities. And nobody did any of that. Just went old-fashioned gumshoe work. So this whole idea, you have to collect this great haystack of information to get these few bad needles is garbage. There's no evidence to support it. And what it does is overwhelms you with minutia. It has nothing. We still don't know who the 15 hijackers were who were from Saudi Arabia on that airplane. Why are we now befriending uh, Saudi Arabia to the degree that where they set our whole policy in the Mideast now? We've, we were being led around by the nose by the very people who supplied the leader of, of, of al-Qaeda, bin Laden, who supplied the money for it, who supplied the religious fanaticism of their Wahhabism, and supplied 15 of the 19 hijackers. And we still know next to nothing about where these people came from, how that was organized. We, we haven't had a public trial of it. We don't have any investigation of it. Instead, we have to gather information on every single human being in the world on the assumption that they're all terrorists. And they're doing it. Why? Because they can do it? They're doing it because the people designing these systems also profit from the threat inflation. That's always been the history. I'm sorry, the term again? Threat inflation. Threat uh, inflation. Yes, this is what Eisenhower warned us about, the general. We had two great generals who became president in Washington and Eisenhower. Right. And Washington warned us to beware the impostures of pretended patriotism and Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex. They had seen it. Threat inflation. Uh, threat inflation. You go to the very people who are going to profit from selling you all of this stuff uh, and, 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 and you also get from them an estimate of who the enemy is and how best to fight them. So now you have the stupidity of you, you have people even ha were urging that we build more carriers to get guys who are in the desert. I mean the whole thing is nuts and, and the fact is we don't do the common sense work. You know, what is ISIS? What does it want? What fuels fanaticism? Uh, you know, how to deal with these people? Well, you know, uh, why are we stoking it? Why did we back these freedom fighters in Afghanistan who ended up being al-Qaeda? Mm -hmm. What was that all about, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's been done by Democratic and Republican presidents, you know? why? Wh what were we doing in Syria? You had in Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq, okay, three rulers, you may not like them, but they were defang despots, basically. They weren't going anywhere. Saddam Hussein, Assad, Assad's son, and then Gaddafi, okay? And what do we do? And they were secular, by the way. They were not religious fanatics, and they were enemies of al-Qaeda, okay? Whatever else you think about them, they didn't like al-Qaeda. What do we do? So what you know, do we do? We wipe we, them out. We went and we invent freedom fighters to go after them, just like we did in Afghanistan. And remember how recently McCain and all these people were talking about the we've got to support the opposition to Assad, and they turn out to be ISIS. They turn out to be these screwballs. They turn out to be al-Qaeda, you know? And, and so you didn't do your homework. You didn't even do, you know, the most cursory. You should have just read the French press, read the uh, Arabic press. You, you would know some of this stuff. 
you know. Uh, and instead, you're investigating everybody who lives in Pasadena, you know, and you can't even figure out where ISIS is coming from. Where did they get their money from? They got it from Saudi Arabia. They're supported by Saudi Arabia. Now they're involved in this stupidity in Yemen. We're going to stoke another religious war. We, who ever even heard about all the Shiites and Sunnis? Now we, we have to decide. Are we on the side of al-Qaeda and the Sunnis? Are we on the side of uh, the Shiites and, and Iran and Yemen? And it's all fantasy. It's nuts. You know, and you wouldn't run any business this way. You you you, you wouldn't run a, a city council this way. And, and so, yes, threat inflation is the name of the game. We have to have enemies. The Cold War was over. What are you going to do? How are you going to support this big military industrial complex? Along comes the gift of terrorism, the gift that doesn't stop giving because it's always going to be unknown to you. It's always going to be international. And you treat it as an undifferentiated enemy and, and everything. And, you know, there are no restraints. This, this will be going on for centuries. Do you see any any heroes in Congress or on in the political landscape that will try to change this or take this on? No, the, my optimism here, mo- most politicians are just cowards when it comes to national security. It's interesting. That's why I mentioned two generals turned president because they had the courage to tell us we're being deceived. You know, Eisenhower, by the way, people forget, Eisenhower was against dropping the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm-hmm. Incredibly prescient. Uh, and because uh, he knew it was unnecessary and he knew it was set a very dangerous precedent. Uh, we're the only ones that have ever used it. Uh, and uh, But anyway, uh, the, the optimism I have derives from two things. Deep down, most people in the world want their privacy. They don't want to be under the microscope all the time. They don't want to be observed all the time. And that creates a problem for our uh, technology companies, for Apple, for Google, uh, you know, all these companies. Why? Because they basically are selling. This, this is our most important export right now is information technology. And in order for this to work for a multinational corporation, they have to convince people around the world that they are not beholden to one nation state. They are not subservient to the NSA or the CIA or the FBI. They are truly multinational. And this is what Facebook knows, is what Apple knows, is what Google knows. You want to get into the India market, China market, you want to get into Europe, we are, they're there, big in the European market, you want to stay there, you have to have the confidence of people there. You can't be tapping Angela Merkel's phone in Germany. You can't be tapping the head of the Brazilian government. Uh, and, and people get that. Uh, and, and so they push back. The European Union says, you know, you're not going to do it here. No, and China says, you're not going to come in our market. We'll have Chinese companies. Now three of the ten biggest companies are Chinese because they say, hey, you better go with the devil you know than the devil you don't. And so what, what has happened is uh, that these companies suddenly – now, before Snowden, they didn't tell us all this. You know, they were in bed with the military-industrial complex. They were, they were part of it. Uh, the book goes into it in great detail. But after Snowden's revelation, they had to scramble for cover. And they say, well, no, we were forced to do this. And, you know, we weren't allowed to tell you what we were doing. And now they're organizing uh, to rein in the NSA. Uh, you know, so for me, the positive part of this story... Is you know Leonard Cohen, who I, I love quoting a, a poet, singer who is uh, as old as I am or older, and he says, "There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets through." And and uh, that, the crack with the multinational corporations is if you're really, and this is the future of capitalism. If you're going to be multinational, you have to be loyal to people all over the world. You can't betray them. And if you're asking them to give you their data. Where are they? What are, who are they with? What are they doing? Right? They're not going to give it to you if they think you're an agent of the CIA. You see? So, so that's why in the case of my book, if, when, I, when people reprint chapters in my book, which Salon did and say we do on our website, you'll see at the bottom of the excerpt, there'll be a Google ad pops up because it hit their algorithm. And, and it's, but it's not a, a third party ad. It's Google. And they're mm-hmm. saying, join us in taking, saving the Internet. That's the message. Join us, take back the Internet, reign in the NSA. And this June, uh, we, we're going to have to decide, do we want to renew the Patriot Act? It's up for you know, renewal or it dies. 
and and Google and Apple and Facebook, you know, Instagram, all these companies are organizing to rein in the NSA. And I think this is a great that has a great potential for organizing the way we began this whole conversation. Sure, sure. What can you do? I am quite optimistic. Uh, I think it's not just these companies, but the people who these companies are supposed to be serving. And it's very interesting. You can't really call the people who use Google their customers because they're the marks, right? The people who use Gmail and so forth, they're basically given the service for free. So they're not customers, and they're given it for, in exchange for their surrendering their private information. Okay. Now, that but works. They don't, but they don't know they're sur- I mean, they know they're filling out a form, but they don't know that it's going to be used someplace no, else No, but they're making the assumption that it's a private activity. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and they're defining freedom as the freedom to shop. They're basically saying consumer sovereignty is the most important thing, and I want to get to And I do it myself. I'll give Apple uh, my f- thumbprint on my iPhone 6 uh, probably 100 times today. You know, if I want to go to a movie, I want to find a restaurant, I want to go on Amazon and see what some book, I want to read my own website, you know, I, I give my thumbprint, give my thumbprint. Give my thumb. If some government had asked me that anywhere in the world, I would say that defines them as the most totalitarian government. You can't make a move without your fingerprint, mm-hmm. okay? It's, it's outrageous. We do it. Why? Because we think it's part of our shopping experience, right? And we don't think we're really going to do anything that's going to trouble the government. Well, if we don't think we're going to do anything that's going to trouble the government, we're betraying our obligation as citizens in a free society. Right. We are supposed to trouble the government. We are supposed to challenge it. We are supposed to rein it in. So what has happened is the American people went along and people around the world didn't go along as easily. There's pushback from Europe. You know, Google has had a hard time in Europe most recently. Uh, but American people went along with the idea that basically this is a private sector activity. And you're right. They didn't read the fine print. They still don't. They assume these are private companies. And they're not going to screw up because if they do, I'll go to another private company. They didn't know that the NSA and the CIA can tap into their fiber optic cables under the sea. They didn't know that they had backdoor entrance into their systems. They didn't know they could plant code on their hardware and turn everything in your house, your thermostat, everything else into a spy operation against you. It's, it's really in, incredibly frightening. and it will All be, with uh, the assumption that they're protecting against terrorism. Yeah. Yeah, with no record of showing that it has any effect in a positive uh, way. But but the, the real problem is they're destroying... A great thing. See, let me let me explain. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against technology. I love the Internet. I edited an Internet publication called Truth Dig. I've been working on computers since 1958 when I worked on, a, on an IBM punch guard system that took up a huge warehouse in Syracuse, New York. It was the first time I ever dealt with, with, with computers. So I've loved this stuff for a very long time. And as I mentioned earlier in this interview, the question of learning disabilities, you know, I would I can't be a writer without carrying. I carry something around all the time. A laptop, I, you know, bought the first Wang 3 and hardwired at my house. Why? Because I can do spell check. I can move paragraphs around. It's really freed me as a writer, and I, I love it. I love the educational tool. I love being able to read papers all over the world that are instantly translated. I love the fact that on our website, we'll post stories today and people can read them in Shanghai and Dublin without cutting down any more trees and without shipping them everywhere and burning a lot of oil. So I love the whole technology. But what's happened is that our government has led the fight to destroy trust in the Internet, you know, to destroy it as a vital means of communication. That's a heavy price to pay for a stupid government. That's really what we're talking about. They're, they're endangering something that has great educational potential, great potential to save democracy. You know, and they're they're going to turn it into something we have to treat with suspicion. That's the real problem. They know everything about you, how data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Robert Scheer, this is a great piece of work, and we thank you for it. Thank you for having me. And we thank you for all that you've done, the, the marvelous writing. Carla, do you have any questions? I, no, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just delighted. To, like, everything you said, it's like, I wish you could run for office not just the the congress but hell run for president but hey you know so uh thanks it's important that you're out there fighting the fight man and, and saying things that need to be heard and yeah 
So you come back sometime? Oh, yeah, anytime. I like it. What a view you got. Yeah. yeah and that's going to be the <laughs> tallest building in, in this part of, what, this side of the Mississippi? I think so. Oh, yeah, the U.S. Bank is, yeah. yeah. No, 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 the Korean Airline Building. Oh, Don't you even know what's going right. up oh, yeah, right yeah, yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, are you guys out to lunch? No. Don't you ever look out the window? <laughs> Well, here's but okay. So let's remember what I owe you. I promise you the the the, the Alda book, yeah, okay? Yeah. And I know you're gonna love it. And at some point, I'm gonna get to you the copy of that of that of that baseball ticket I told you I found. No, that'd be great. Oh, three wow. three dollars and fifty cents. I think we should all go to a Dodger game together. Sure. Or you don't like baseball? No, he doesn't. Like have to figure it out. It's too I didn't slow. say I don't like baseball. It's too slow ba- for him. No, I like baseball because you can have a conversation. I'll tell you what. I get the best. I get great seats, dirt cheap at Dodger Stadium because I have a uh, I have a chronic foot problem that gets me. ADA seating, so we can get killer oh. seats hovering over home plate. Oh, there you go. I swear to God. So you have a good time. I, I go to my share of Dodger yeah. games. But I, I know I do like it. No, frankly, I, I do like it for the conference. Look, the main reason I like to go in the games, particularly the Laker games, and, and you know, this is the worst season ever, and uh, you know, I still go because I can actually talk to my sons or my wife uninterrupted. Right, I mean, the only big issue is do we go get the sushi or we sure. get the California sure. pizza? But you know, you're you're there and you can actually have a conversation. You know, uh, cool. yeah, so it's great. Well, once again, Bob Shear, they know everything about you. How data uh, data collecting corporations and snooping government agencies are destroying democracy. Go out and get the book. It's an amazing read. Um, it 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 tells some ama- some some facts that scare you, should alarm you but should also keep you engaged and keep you involved. Um, freedom is our best, is our best resource, and this, and this book will help you learn why we need to continue to work to protect it. Bob Shear, it's been a, a real honor to have you here. Let me just add something, and you can cut it if you've gone over it. You know, all right, all right. Thing, but no, I, 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 somebody waiting for just to let you know, but yeah, go ahead. Huh? No, we're fine. Okay, Go ahead. Go ahead. Still on? Okay. No, I just want to make a point. I, I, I know because I teach, you know, I'll teach tonight. I taught last sure. night. And I know that people want to think the best. They want to think they're leaders. Their government is benign. Sure. Uh, they want to underestimate the impact of this very intrusive technology. Yeah. And I want to just say, have, being a bit on the other side, because I do edit a publication where millions of people mm-hmm. come to it every month, and I can see I see what you can learn, even if you, you know, don't exploit it. And people should not underestimate the power of this technology. It, it destroys the basic ingredient of human experience, which is contemplation. Having a place where you can sit by yourself under a tree and think. And then maybe have a beer with some friends. That's what they're in the in the colonies. How, this is what, one of the rare moments of sanity that come, has come out of our current Supreme Court, Justice Roberts, in a decision last June uh, on the cell phone case, and where the Supreme Court unanimously, right. the liberals and the current conservatives, demanded warrants. Uh, right. Yes, said. Right. You know, you arrest somebody, you can't grab that smartphone, crack the code, and use that data because it's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment, to have a living constitution, has to apply to this modern technology. There's more data on that phone than was ever in anybody's home. And so this protection has to go to that phone. This was Justice Roberts. It's an incredibly powerful decision and people should understand and he made the point that the american revolution was fought over this right to privacy it was fought over preventing the agents of the king from rummaging around in your personal information in your life if you don't have that you're not free people you're not free to associate you're not free to think unconventional thoughts to challenge you know what could have been more unconventional to say hey we're out here in the wilderness of, of the colonies, and we're going to challenge the most powerful government in the world, the King of England. And most of us are from England. We've revered the king. You know, we, we bought into the system. We participated in churches that respected the king. And now I'm going to tell you here that we're going to make a revolution and, and challenge those people. And we're the rabble. We don't have that kind of disciplined army. We don't have those ships. And yet we're going to do it, okay? That's pretty wild. And, and, and the whole idea in, in framing this Constitution is people should be able to have such ideas, should think that way, should be able to challenge the basic way it's working. That's how you make history in, in, in a truly progressive 
way. That's how the human experience is enhanced. And, and we've lost that. And what I hear from a lot of people when they hear about my book, they say, oh, but I'm not going to do anything that's going to get the government interested in me. Well, then you're not going to be a citizen. If you're not going to have any thoughts or do anything that's going to make your government a little bit apprehensive, then your government's going to go unchecked. You know, they're not going to be challenged. They're not going to worry about their screwing up. And they're just going to go from bad to worse. So that's the story. It's really what we're talking about is this great experiment of ours and whether it will continue or it's going to die. Well, no one says it better than you, sir. <laughs> and we thank you. Thank you. This is the campaign with Ernie Powell on Radio Titans. Thank you again, Bob Shirt. But it's too dark now to read. <laughs> 